Once again, I'm Captain Nick Pavlakis from Marine Max in St. Petersburg, Florida. Beside, be, beside me today, as always, of course, a man that needs no introduction, YouTube superstar, Captain, <laughs> there. Captain Keith, how about it, baby? Hey, good, mo good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon. All right. So i um, got a lot of great stuff to talk today, but of course, wanted to thank you guys for last week, all the great feedback, all the questions. That's uh, that's really what it's all about. Keeps our heads above water, gives us something to talk about. Um, a lot of great questions last week. Sorry we couldn't get to them all, but um, we're going to get to a few of them today. So don't forget to subscribe. And of course, where to find us, you can find us on, uh, on Facebook at Marine Max Leisure, which is right here. Instagram and YouTube, which is at Marine Max Online for a lot of great walkthrough videos and instructional content. And of course, Twitter, get those Twitter fingers ready at Marine Max. So simple enough. Um, so we're going to be going through a few things today. Um, a few good segments, first of all. One, how to fish on your new boat effectively. Then we're going to make our way into a favorite of mine, which is driving through rough water. Keith's probably the man with that one. And then, uh, and then we're going to go to some questions from the audience after that. So, with that being said, what do you say, Keith? You going to talk about some fish today? Hey, Josh. How you doing, bud? Thanks for joining us. Hey, Gabriel's here, too. All right. Got, hey. We got everybody yeah. tuning in. Yeah, let's give, it a, let's give this a few minutes to so see if we can get some more people on here before we start answering some questions from leftover from last week. But uh, So, how was your weekend, man? Did you get out fishing? Did you do anything? So I did fish actually towards the end of last week. Uh, it took a little slow over the weekend because of the weather, but uh, yeah, it was blowing. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you had a couple deliveries on that Friday. We ended up having to reschedule a couple of them, but uh, finally starting to do a little bit of fishing again. I know, uh, I know Josh is watching. Starting to do a little bit more tarpon fishing. Got a little tarpon bite, so nice. Um, I'm sure you can fill you in on that. A lot of a lot of great stuff going on with the with the Silver King. So, um, you know, you don't need to travel to Isla Mirada or Boca Grande because, you know, the the world-class tarpon fishery right here in Tampa Bay is, is a little underrated in my opinion. So Absolutely. It's, it's friggin' awesome here right off the beach. You got the Skyway Bridge. You got to, you know, your basin. I mean, not that you can fish in there. <laughs> not going to pull anything out of there. But there's more tarpon rolling around in your marina right there per square foot than – it's kind of like Longbow Key moorings down there. I mean, they just stack up in there. It is. It is. Um, back, back in my days as a dock hand, I, uh, I kicked out my fair share of people for uh, for jumping a fish or two. <laughs> yeah, and then you went right back at it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was blowing, you know, and I had a – this pretty cool. Marine Max now is selling Aviaras. Okay. And I had the opportunity to deliver a 36 Aviar, which is the first one here on the west coast of Florida. And uh, it's actually got Ilmore racing engines or Ilmore engines in it. The Ilmore, Ilmore builds racing engines, but these are marine Ilmore engines, stern drive. Right. Uh, 430 horsepower a piece. Uh, the boat ran great. I mean, it was, it's been blowing, running down Tampa Bay. It was pretty snotty. Uh, we kind of did a two day thing, took the boat down south. But uh, I mean, handled handled great. Um, so it's 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 a neat boat, it's really stylish, good looking boat. So if you haven't looked at them, you know anybody watching this, check out the Aviaras. Mm -hmm. All right, got Dustin, Joshua, Susie, Matt, and Landon. Thanks for joining in, guys. Well, uh, Landon, that's a good question. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so this is something. This is a thought that I had the other night. Um, you know, you mentioned the thirty six Aviara. Um, we are in such a outboard market here in Florida, especially in the salt water. You get away from the chain of lakes. It is an outboard market uh, substantially. And one of the things I was thinking is, you know, that, that's kind of a new thing, even in the past, you know, 30 years or so. And then you have guys like Ilmore coming in and they're kind of making a push towards, you know, a real saltwater outdrive engine. And it's like, okay, could, could we kind of, potentially be seeing the start of something new where, you know, you're starting, maybe we can see a little bit of a turn back to the inboards, you know, like in the old days at a sport fishers or something like that. Um, I think that this is a good start and I'm really curious about that 36 Aviara. Um, yep. want, want to get my hands on them. So I don't know. It's something exciting being in the industry. What's yep. next? You know, I think that this is a good step one. Yep. Absolutely. I agree with you. 
So. Yeah. Cool. Well, without any further ado, Landon, I saw you had a question about what advice you have for someone that has never fished but wants to dabble in the idea. Um, so that's that's going to be our first segment. Segment here is how to fish on your boat without completely wasting your time and actually catching fish. Because I get it, a, a bad day of fishing is better than a good day at the office. But but it does make it that much sweeter when you actually get to bring home something for dinner. So, yep, absolutely. I would say before you run out and you jump out on your boat and you're going take some time and go through your boat, even though you got a new boat and maybe a, an older one, but before you leave, you know, your boat's on a trailer at the house, make sure it fires up. So you don't go rolling up to the ramp and then you're sitting there with dead batteries or something. Yeah. Um, you know, check your pumps, make sure all that stuff's working. Um, and then as far as gear and, and looking for things to do, visit your local tackle shops I would, I would recommend like around here in the Pinellas County area, Hillsboro, West Central Florida, we've got a ton of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I've, I could like you say dogfish tackle, bets, masteries, um, O'Neill's. There's a bunch of them, you know, I'm going to leave out a few. I mean, a bunch, but, mm -hmm. but I'm instead, of going to West, instead of going to West Marine or to a Dick Sporting Good or something like that, go to your local shops. And then the knowledge you're going to gain there. I mean, those guys are going to take the time to teach you how to, to use the gear. If you buy a cast net, they're going to teach you how to throw it, you know, what tackle to get. And, you know, don't go to the, you know, Publix and pick up the steel leaders and the sinkers and the beads and, and all that kind of stuff and go out and think you're going to, you know, maybe you want to knock a fish out and hit him over the head with a thing. But, uh, yeah. you know. What, what did they say? There's, there's a very, very fine line between – fishing and standing on your boat with a rod in your hand, like a fool. Yep. Right? So, um, so you can, you cannot be too, you cannot be too proud to ask questions. You cannot be above that at all because you want to talk to the guys that do it for a living. You're talking about going to dogfish tackle or your local tackle shop. Um, I know everybody talks about your secret spots or your fishing secrets, but, but you, you'd be surprised how much and how willing those guys are to give up their spots, their knowledge, their two cents, because there's nothing more rewarding than getting somebody out in the water, seeing them catch a fish and saying, Hey, I helped them do that. And, and they're not hesitant at all. And then I, I mean, I know several of our customers, very, very good clients. The guys that do catch fish have hired guides to take them out on their own boat. And they still do this day, even though they know what's going on, but say they got some buddies in town, business associates or this, that, and they want to have, you know, some time fishing too with them or doing it. They'll hire a guide and then the guide can supply maybe the tackle or look at the tackle they've got. And maybe it not be, it may not be appropriate if you want to go, let's say yellowtail snapper fishing or mango snapper fishing, and you're going to be grouper fishing or, you know, while you're out there on a wreck, you know, the springtime, the tuna are out there. I mean, right now I know so several people that are popping sailfish out here right off the off the beach, kingfishing. Oh yeah. But, um, it's it's just a matter of putting the time in. But if you you get somebody that's knowledgeable on your boat, like I said, and these guys are all willing to help. It's it's a tight knit community. Right. It um it is a very tight knit community, and just like we talked about the tackle shops being so willing to provide that information, the the guides are the same way, whether you're going out on their boat or they're coming out on your boat, take the time, spend a little bit of money, hire the guide and it will pay big time dividends because at the end of the day, that's what they do for a living. Like how, you know, our, our job is to be a Marine max. Everybody's got some way that they put food on their table. That's uh, that's uh, that's the way that the guides, they provide for their families and, and their life literally depends on catching fish. So why not hire them and, and take a few nuggets here and there and then before you know it, just a few times doing that, you'll be able to do it on your boat and really enjoy the boat that you purchased and uh, yeah. put some Somebody just asked a good question. I mean, how do you find a good guide? Well, it's kind of like word of mouth, right? Like Marine Max, we make fans. So, you know, you do something right, then they're going to tell somebody and they're going to tell somebody. Well, if you've got a friend, a neighbor, or somebody that's 
been catching fish or consistently catches fish, they may be able to recommend somebody to you. But then once again, you go to your, you get to know your local uh, tackle stores. They're going to have guides that work in and out of there and they're going to be able to recommend somebody for you. Um, and like locally right here in, in the West central Florida here, there's a fishing club, you know, it's the old, called the old salts been around for years and years and years, very charitable raised, who knows how much money for different charities. So you got the old salts fishing club. And then there's a lot of tournaments like Nick and I fish in the Suncoast Kingfish classic that donate tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to charity as well. So at those type events, that's where you're going to kind of meet that group of people that, you know, you want to be kind of associated with and get into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Word of mouth is, is kind of what these guys thrive on. And also don't, there, there's plenty of good Facebook groups too. Um, you know, all sorts of different pages for different kinds of fishing and, you know, they're going to work with those guides and stuff like that. But um, hire a guide, whether it's on your boat or you're going out on theirs. I mean, it's just the wealth of knowledge that you'll get is endless. And, and there's different guides that specialize in different types of fishing too. Like I know Josh, we got some great grouper guys on here that are good with the offshore fishing stuff. There's guys that, there's tarpon guys that will have their boat in storage for, for, for eight months a year, just waiting for tarpon to show up. And that's, and that's what they do. Um, you know, everybody kind of fine tunes their own little ways a little bit and even fishing with different guides too. I mean, I've fished with so many different guys throughout the course of my life. You pick up little nuggets here and there and, uh, yeah, you learn of, something every day. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you learn something on every trip, right? You pick something up from somebody. Um, and besides, and, and besides getting the right tackle, also learn knots, you know, how to tie lures, whether it's, you know, a, a loop knot, a snell, an FG for the fine stuff for, in, you know, fishing inshore. YouTube, seriously, just get on YouTube. has got anything you want there. Just do YouTube fishing knots and practice, 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 practice. It's all preparation. Mm. It is. And, you know, even those guys that we're talking about, they didn't get good overnight. At the end of the day, if you put your time in, you'll score. I mean, how, how many tarpon guys are watching this right now? That How many days have you sat at this guy without catching anything? I mean, you do need to put your time in, but uh, there, there are certain things that you can do to kind of maximize those efforts. They say 10% of fishermen catch 90% of fish. So there's something to be said there. You, you, you can be the guy buying frozen shrimp from Publix with the steel leader, or you, or, you, or you can be the guy coming home with a cooler full of fish. Putting put, put the bread, putting the so, butter on the bread. So we got Michael Lucas on here. He's a freshwater guy that's, uh, you know, using worms as bait and stuff like that. So what's mostly used in the ocean and golf fishing? It all depends on the species of fish you're going for, right? You've got different, you got different choices. If you're after pelagics, like maybe in the Keys or the Atlantic, uh, a lot of people will troll. And you, know, you could have pre, you can have ballyhoo, or you know ballyhoo and skirts. You can you know pull feathers, all kinds of lures, all different kinds of things like that. For bottom fishing, it's mostly you know like frozen sardines, live bait. Uh, learn to throw a cast net. Real important for your live bait stuff. You know where you're getting. Scaled sardines, sardines, cigar minnows, blue runners, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's also another little thing called a sabiki rig, which mm -hmm. is invaluable. We've all got them. Uh, you're out along any kind of structure, pilings, uh, channel markers, wrecks, stuff like that. They're little gold hooks and sabiki rigs, and you'll catch six, seven, eight, you know, bait fish at a time on those. Mm -hmm. I think. I think another thing. Michael to answer that is know what you're fishing for. I mean, we are fortunate enough here to, to have a 12 month boating season for the most part. I mean, sometimes it's a little bit colder than other months and you might not get as many good weather days, but it's very seasonal with the fish too. You're, you're going to target your groupers and your snappers a whole different way in January as you would in, in, in July. And you're, and you might even be targeting a completely different fish. I mean, you're talking about the pelagic seas. I mean, we've got a great kingfish around here. And it's so short and so sporadic. Um, you know, it's such it's such a great thing to know exactly what you're fishing for and going out and essentially not wasting your time. 
So, all right. Be before we move on to another question, we got some good questions rolling in here. Um, pick one. What is your most memorable day? Memorable day fishing, and it's crazy. We think about this one day. We talk about this one day, and it's like, all right, you remember everything about it. You remember waking up. You remember getting bait. You remember putting your time in a night before even. You remember every little thing about that day that, that makes it so memorable. And and I almost want to call it intimate in a way. And and that's what's so special about that. I mean, what other thing can you do where you can wake up in the morning and think, hey, this could be one of the best days of my life? Yep. Right? So what's that one day for you? There's probably three, but they all center around the same thing with king fishing. Um, we got, uh, this is probably back in 97, uh, the fall, Suncoast Kingfish Classic. We won that tournament with a fish that was just a little under 40 pounds. Um, but the preparation you talk about, I mean, everything that led up to it, you know, for weeks ahead of time, you know, you're tying stainless steel rig, you're tying rigs, you're getting prepared, you got a game plan. And we were fishing in a little 23 foot century and we went offshore had no business being out there. It was really, really rough. I mean, it was horrible. Because it's a kingfish tournament. So, we, yeah, we had made it out to the 10 fathom wreck, 60 foot of water, fished out there for a little while, and nothing going on. So it was just so rough. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't go into the wave sideways. Cut the engine and just started drifting and just kind of surfing with the waves. Had a big old blue runner down on a downrigger. Buck, uh, it was me, Buck, and Mike. Mike and I are sitting up in the bow trying to figure out what we're going to do for day two. It was a two-day tournament and figuring out just what we're having for dinner. Buck's sleeping in the back of the boat, and all of a sudden, you got that sound, right? And then just like that, everything changes, you know? So, you know, Buck's on the rod, and we jump up. Mike's behind the wheel. I'm on the gaff, and then you see him doing that slow spin as they're coming up, you know, and you stick them with the gaff and then up over the rail, and it hits the deck. And then it's high fiving and jumping up and down and the hollering and all that. So you go in, that's day one. And it was so rough, which we may talk about this in the rough water stuff. We couldn't run north to get back to John's Pass because the wind was blowing out of the north. We actually ended up having to run down to the ship channel. We tucked in behind a freighter that was breaking it down for us, made it into Egmont up in by the Skyway and then ran the intercoastal waterway back up to the weigh-in up at John's Pass. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can remember, like I said, you remember everything about that day. Um, and then we had to wait for the results because then it was a s fished again on Sunday and nobody beat it on the, the second day. So that was that was that one. Uh, we got uh, third place at the King of the Beach a few years ago, second place in Calcutta. Um, and then uh, the Grand Old Opry Tournament, which there's probably not a lot of people remember that, but it was a, a two day tournament and it was a hundred thousand dollars first prize. And the end of the first day we were, we were sitting in third place. I think we ended up getting bumped down to fourth and there's a big payout difference between the third and right, fourth. Right. But, uh, but you know, the Kingfish tournaments and, and that's the, just when that, you see that fish and it hits the deck and then it's, then it's all over. Then it's all smiles and, you know, running home, you know. It is. And, and it, last week you talked about how in the zone you are and there's so much preparation around it. There's so much anticipation and, and it's like, boom, it pays off in one minute and that's what it's all about. And, and that's what makes it all worth it. I've, I've got a very similar story um, fishing with Josh Campbell. We were, it was really the second, it was the second year that we actually dabbled in, uh, we actually dabbled in king fishing. All right. We, we were at a public wreck. I'm not going to say which one it was, but it was a public wreck out of Tarpon Springs and it was king at a beach. And, and it's intimidating, man, fishing those kingfish tournaments. I mean, you've got some guys fishing those tournaments that are, that's what they do. They're, they're good. I mean, they've, they've got it dialed in like, like it's down to the science and, and just, you know, just anybody can win it. Right. And that's what, and that's what makes it exciting. And we were out there at this wreck and we're going through the jacks. I mean, we're going through the jacks one after another. 
doubling up, tripling up, and then we put the biggest blue runner we had in the well out. And I'm talking, this was like a two pounder. It, it, it was one of those blue runners that you look at the other white ones you think are big and think, hey, this one's going to eat them. And uh, when that kingfish hit, Keith, the only way that I can describe it, the only word that I can use is just belligerent. I mean, when that fish hit and the way that that drag went off, it was like he had a chip in his shoulder directly against us. And, and I'll never forget it. And, and like you're talking about, it does the circle. You see the color and you put it in the boat and just it, it, it seems surreal for, yeah. for, for not even minutes, for hours until it all sets in. Yeah. And, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I do. And going back to the scales, we were the first ones to weigh in at King of the Beach. And this is the this is the bad part of the story. This is where it turned. We were the first ones to weigh in. We had to wait a couple hours before they even opened the scales. And and we did. We hung a forty two pound fish, and we held first place for that whole tournament. The very last fish that got weighed in that was the year that uh, that Dave Mistretta won it was a forty nine pounder and. I mean, talk talk about a feeling of going from thinking you had it until knowing you didn't, and and then you come back next year and do it all again. Were you in the Calcutta? We were in the Calcutta. We actually we made out pretty good in that tournament, even in second yeah. place. But uh, but but the gap is so big between that first and second place. Oh yeah. <laughs> Especially now, once they blew it open, where you got all these boats fishing it, it's it's a big money tournament. It is. Yep. Yes, it is. But definitely, it's a bummer that a lot of them got canceled this year, but but they'll be back. They will. So we talk about fishing tournaments. We talk about the rough water. It's always rough. That's a given. I, I can't remember. I mean, maybe one out of 10% of these kingfish tournaments, you actually have stuff that you would normally go out in. It's going to be rough. And you don't always have the choice to go out in the rough water. Or you, I'm sorry, you do have the choice to not go out when it's rough, but you don't always have the choice to come back in. You get caught out there, and, and it's not fun. It's not, it's not a happy time. Everybody's wet. But, but what are some tips to making your boat ride well and keeping everybody comfortable, dry for the most part, and keeping your boat safe when you do need to come back in for – and sometimes between you and land, it's not so nice. Well, take it slow, take it easy, right? I mean, try to try to stay comfortable, keep everybody comfortable on the boat. And I mean, whether you're fishing or not, or you're just out in your boat and a storm kicks up and you got to get home. You know, when you're the captain and you're at the helm and you're driving, you're in control. You've got the throttle, you're holding on the wheel. You can feel what the boat's going to do. You know, the guests that are with you, you know, they're you get the ones you got to make sure you kind of, you know, they're hanging on good and all that if the, the smoothest part of the boat is going to be back on the transom back where the engines are because you're going to get less bow rise less bounce less bump and all that um and like i said in that one tournament that we were in it was so rough we had to tuck in behind a tanker coming in the ship channel and we just you know sat behind it and it knocked the waves down for us if you're in a group of boats Marine Max does getaways and there might be 10, 12, 15 boats now we're going down to the Keys or the Bahamas. And if it gets snotty out, we'll put the bigger boats up in the lead. So the smaller boats then at the same time can tuck in and sit on the transoms of the, of the bigger ones to, to knock the waves down. Mm -hmm. Now if you're out on your own and you're running along. If your boats, let's say over 20, what, 25, 26 feet, you're probably going to have trim tabs on the boat. Mm -hmm. So trim tab use can be really useful in this situation. So your boat, even if it's not real rough, but if you're running along, trim tabs are going to allow you to adjust the boat side to side. So your boat inherently is going to have an in inclination to lean into the wind. You would think the wind's going to blow you over. Right. But does, the wave or water action is pushing underneath the, the bottom of the boat. And the, just the way physics, the boat leans into the, way, into the wind. So with your tabs, then you're able, instead of riding around like a V8 commercial, you're able to, to level the boat out. And so on your indicator, it'll say bow up and bow down. So say I'm leaning to starboard, which is the right-hand side, and I need to lower my port bow down to level myself out. 
I'm going to push that top left button that says bow down on the port hand side or on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. And you're going to feel your bow is going to go from starboard to port and you're going to level out. What's actually happening is the trim tab that's on the transom on the starboard side is going down. So as that tab's going down, water pressure's hitting that tab as you're running, which is going to lift the starboard stern of the boat up and roll the port bow down to allow you to level out. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're running into the waves, you're pretty much going to drop your trim tabs down a little bit. And that's going to, if you push them both down, it's going to push your bow down a little and allow you to cut through the waves instead of smacking as we're going along. Mm -hmm. But in the converse of that is say we've got a following C and you're running and it's as you're coming up on the wave and it's pushing your bow down as you're kind of surfing down them. You want to make sure your tabs are fully up so that you don't push that bow further down into the backside, mm -hmm. you know, the wave. So it's multi-dimensional with it. You can, you can adjust the boat port to starboard. You can adjust the bow down or you can trim it to where you got the highest elevation of it, you know, all the way up out of the water coming up. It, and not to overcomplicate things here, but you, you could probably shed some light on this. Trimming with the engines, multi-engine boats, do you recommend it or no, or do you leave them all the way down? Yes, engine trim is going to raise the bow. Mm -hmm. So on, let's say, your outboard boats or stern drives, when you're trimmed all the way down, you've actually got a little bit of negative trim on it so that when you accelerate, that's going to get you on plane faster. It's going to push the bow up and it's going to come down and it's going to lay on the surface. Then as we start trimming the engine up a little bit, as it comes up, now your propeller, instead of pushing you straight through the water, is going to be pushing down on the transom of the boat, elevating the bow. So as you're running through the water, it's peeling the bow up off the water surface. So now you got less drag, less friction on the water surface. Your RPMs are going to increase. Your speed's going to increase, but you're not giving it any more gas. So actually, if you if you got GPS and you can watch your speed and then you can look at your fuel consumption, you can figure out kind of where the sweet spot is on there. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if you get it trimmed up too high, you're going to start cavitating or grabbing air, which then you're, you know, you just need to bump it down a little bit. So you're grabbing water again. Mm -hmm. Or you just push mercury active trim and uh, let it go work. <laughs> well, how's that work? Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll hit on that on another episode, but I'm a big fan of active trim. But um, yeah, I think that that hit the nail right on the head. Keith. Active trim's growing on me for sure. Yeah. I was skeptical. Now that's something else too. Those of you that got joysticks, if so, if the joystick piloting system and you're maneuvering the boat around the dock, when you go to that joystick, those engines are going to trim up a couple inches. So once you pull away from the dock and you're good going along and you're ready to get up on plane, make sure you trim those engines back down again, all the way down. And then you're going to be able to, to jump up and get back on plane and up on top running faster. And then you can start peeling them up. Um, we've got videos of all this stuff on the Marine Max Boating Tips mm -hmm. uh, YouTube channel. So there's, there's a section in there on trim tabs. There's a section in there on trimming your engines up. There's a section in there on docking with the joystick around the dock. So, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of info out there on the Marine Max YouTube channel, boating tips. Good stuff. And uh, I think there's a pretty cool guy that uh, does those videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, cool, Keith. I appreciate that, man. That was, that was really helpful. I know that as far as hours on the water, you've, you've probably got just about as many as anybody on the West coast of Florida. So, Hey, Hey, Debbie Daniels just asked a question. Can't you catch fish in smooth water? I'm not a daredevil. Of course. I'll tell you, so Debbie, so Nick, now we're, yes, seems like the tournaments are out there on rough days, but the 42 pound kingfish we got that got us third in the king of the beach a few years ago. I think it's four years ago now. Um, it was a perfect glass. This is like never happens. You, you, we always wish it would, right? You talk about 
Perfect glass, calm day. We're offshore. Baits are out. I'm fighting a fish. I'm up on the bow. We've other we've got another line, a couple lines out back. So as my buddy Gusto went back to start clearing the lines, as he cranked a couple times, that cigar man all of a sudden it changes its pace. His got hit. So now I'm up on the bow fighting a fish. He's on the stern fighting a fish. We kind of would get him back up. We look at mine. We look at his. His is bigger. So release mine. And then we, we get his. And it was not even nine o'clock in the morning. And we got a 42 pound something pound fish in the box. And then we put the lines back out. We started catching hammerhead sharks and black, all kinds of stuff. So it was a crank up. In this tournament, you can bring your fish to the weigh-in. You know, you could stop at a dock first or go to the weigh-in later, the way the rules are. So we literally cranked up and left at 9 o'clock. We were back to the, to the lift and hanging out in the pool and watching football games at 1 o'clock before we went back to the – went to take the fish to the weigh-in. So, I mean, talk about the dream days, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I'll just always remember that too, you know. Right. It's, uh, it's one of those days that it's like, you know, you, on that given moment, it's like nothing else in the world is wrong because everything's just so perfect right there. Yeah. One of those, uh, definitely one of those anomalies where you have a, a calm water kingfish day for sure. Hey, Alex, thanks for joining us. How you doing? And who else we got on here? Don Ross, the electronics expert. So you got a buddy there, Don Edmonds, too. So. Oh yeah, he's a uh, he's a charter guide up in uh, Cape Cod. He uh, he fishes. Oh, cool. for striped bass and tuna fish. So, yeah. Hey, last week we had a question by Dave McGee. I don't know if he's on here or not, but if he watches this later, he was asking us about the sunscreen on the cushions and upholstery and how to get rid of it. Well, I checked with uh, one of our local detailers here. So I told him we get back to him. So what he recommends is like spray nine formula 409, simple green, some type of cleaner like that. Spray it with that, you know, rub that in, try to get it off with that. Then thoroughly wash the cushions with soap and water and let them dry. Let them get totally dry. And then go back over it with 303 protectant, which will put a new, good, fresh, you know, seal over them and keep them, you know, pliable and and stuff. Another thing too, I mean, sunscreen. Sit on towels if you got sunscreen, or if you got a new bathing suit. Your wife or girlfriend just got a new suit from Venus or something. Then you know, sit on a towel till you know it's not going to bleed and and uh, transfer color stuff like that. Be careful about that. Grocery bags. You go to uh, Publix or somewhere and you set a plastic bag down on your seat cushion. Oh, David. That ink on those bags can actually transfer over to your seat. So be careful about, you know, what you put on your seat cushions. I had a, got a couple of good questions coming in over text too. I had okay. our in-house detailer also give a quick spin on that because I did a little bit of research too. So, he told me with the sunscreen, another thing to use is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, I don't, does Mr. Clean make them, the, the magic erasers? Yep. Um, it, th that's exactly what they are. They're magic. They're great. They, yep. So what he recommended was, yeah, that normal degreaser, whether it's spraying on or whatever, spraying that on there and hitting it with a magic eraser to get the sunscreen out. But like you talked about, you don't want to dry up that upholstery. So. What is it? Is it 303 that you recommend? 303, 303 protected. Yep. Keep, keeping it from drying out. Because a lot of these boats down here, especially in Florida, we're going to have a lot of bow seating, a lot of upholstery and stuff like that. And you don't want to dry that out because it's uh, it's not fun to replace. And, and it's probably a pretty important part of your boating day. So, there you go, David. There you go. Uh, somebody uh, also last week asked us about things to look for on a demo ride. So oh, somebody's yeah. interested in buying a boat and they're looking at our boats versus competitors or, or any boat. What do you, 
what do you recommend? What what should the customer, the, the client, potential buyer be focused on when you take them out on a on a demo ride? I'm going to go down two roads with this. Um, we're going to go, we're going to branch off of new boats and used boats. Okay. So with Marine Max, every used boat we take in on trade is going to be put through an, expen an extensive inspection. I'm talking 150 points, engine services, the whole nine yards. You're buying a boat on your own, you're going to inherit a little bit of risk. The number one thing that I look for on sea trials on used boats, look at the electrical work. Um, you can't hide that. You look for nice electrical, it's probably an indicator of the rest of the boat, how the wiring is, if the boat's going to need a rewire, and, and stuff like that. You go towards number two. You go to the new boat side of things. The most important thing to me is the ride of a boat. And, that, and that's why I'm so, we're so fortunate to represent Boston Whaler because I did a video a little while ago where we called something called Whaler Weather. So what's Whaler Weather? It's, it's when it's not nice, you're in a nice big boat, you're in a foam filled boat, and you know that it's going to ride better than any other boat on the market. So you're out on a sea trial, you're obviously concerned about the ride. Don't be scared of a little bit of chop. It's going to show you how the boat performs. Sit in different places of the boat too. That's that's one thing that I've I've seen a lot of boat buyers do is they'll even if it's one person, five minutes sitting in a transom, five minutes sitting on the bow. Where are you going to visualize yourself using the boat and and bring your family too? Bring your family. Get everybody involved because it's uh it, it's something that you're going to be spending a lot of time doing hopefully and making a lot of great memories. Yeah. Yep. I think the stability of the boat, right? Like you're talking about sitting in different spots and doing things, you know, feel how, how stable it is. The fit and finish of the boat you're looking at too, which ties into, is, are things rattling? Are things shaking? How solid is it? You know, every, every boat runs great on a nice glass calm day, right? And mm -hmm. if you happen to be testing a boat on one of those days, Get out there, start doing some donuts, make some waves, go through, slam that boat into some waves and just feel and make sure, you know, that you got a good solid, solid ride underneath you. Drive it like you stole it. Yep. It is hard port, hard to starboard, put it in a spin, see if it tries to slide out on you. Does it stay bit? Is it, do you have control the whole time? Mm -hmm. You know, and if, you know, those of you, your husband and wife on the boat, both of you run the boat. Both of you get in there. When I do deliveries, you know, everybody's going to, you know, get behind the wheel and, you know, and run that boat. I like it. I like it. Kids, too. They're old enough, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but that's good stuff, Keith. All right. John, test driving an SPX 19 outboard and 210 SPX. Good choice. Good choice. Probably a... Uh, Probably the most popular boat by volume that we've sea trialed and sold in. And you'll be happy. I'll tell you that. Yep. Moving on. Last week, Judith asked, let's see where we are here. Good places to dock and eat on the water. Now, a lot of these places are still doing dockside carry out. And that's another great way to support your local business. Top three, Keith. Go. Or, or can I hold up four fingers there? Three. Three, four. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is, you know, worldwide, countrywide. So, I mean, we just, you know, our area around here, um, I'm up here in Tampa Bay. More so, you're more over at the beach. Uh -huh. So, we've got Hula Bay right over here off of uh, West Shore in Tampa. Mm -hmm. Floating docks, super easy, nice in and out. Um, downtown St. Petersburg right up along the seawall right next to frescoes right at the the in the to the furthest west side of st pete municipal marina there's a seawall there and they've probably got a dozen slips and they're available on a first come first serve basis but there's a parking meter there and you pay just like you're parking on the street you pay a dollar an hour so you just go to the go to the to the app put in your slip number and how long you want to be there and downtown St. Pete, I mean, it's booming. There's tons of restaurants and, and things to do down there, museums, restaurants, bars, the whole thing. So you can just tie your boat up there and then, uh, you know, go walk around downtown. 
And then if you're running south, so like earlier this week, I was down towards Sarasota. Um, there's a place down there called Mar Vista that's off the hook. It's really good. And there's actually a brand new one where Moore's was, the Stone Crab next door. Right. It's gone, but there's a brand new restaurant. Uh, I forget the name of it uh, going in there now. It's, I guess it's open now. So, and it's, they did a lot. It's the whole thing. It looks like it's been rebuilt. So it looks pretty cool. So yeah. that's, that's, that's three there, but there, I mean, up and down the coast, right? Right. Salt rock grill. Yeah. Island grill. Yeah. Island grill. Island grill. How can you tell I've been to a few of them? <laughs> <laughs> you got to try them all, right? <laughs> So my top three are going to be um, one Marvis. Uh, you nail you nailed it right on the head. It's like man, when you're down there, it's like you're in old Florida. It's like it, you you would think that you think that you're in the Keys. You think that you're in Island Rada with the trees and everything, with the way the water is down there. That's that's definitely my number one. Yep, you sit out under you sit out underneath those old buttonwood trees. Yeah. Yep. Two curveball the wharf. I love the wharf, man. They've uh, you know, riding past the grill there, it's they're really friendly. They've got they've got uh, usually a dock in there to help you tie up. Food's good, and of course, if you're not driving, you know, sober skipper, they give you these to-go drinks, right? And these big styrofoam cups, and uh, <laughs> and, and they are awesome. And and three, I'm gonna have to go with Hula Bay. Just making that trip on down inside Tampa Bay, there, it's 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 a different experience, but it's it's definitely a good one. And it, it gets packed there on the weekends, so. But a floating dock too, like you talked about. Yep. Just had a question in by text, Keith, from Steve in Tampa. He says, let me pull it up here. Here's my question. New boat owner, what maintenance needs to be done at 100 hours? And this is somebody with a Mercury... 115 horsepower pro XS four stroke. So, so tell me what that hundred horsepower or that, I'm sorry, that hundred hour service looks like besides just coming, bringing in a Marine Max and saying, all right, let's make it happen. <laughs> That's pretty much what I'm going to say. Cause I'm not, I'm not the tech or I'm not yeah. the service rider service manager on that. Um, it'll be in your owner's manual, basically kind of like the, what they're going to do. But the nice thing with these Mercury's now is there's no more 20 hour break in period right. on them. It's just at 100 hours or annually, whichever comes first. I know they do an A service and a B service. One's a little more extensive than the other. They kind of alternate each year. Um, changing oil, fluids, looking things over, hooking it up to a computer. Um, I mean, that's more of a, a service technical aspect part mm -hmm. of it, um, unless you know exactly what it is that they, they do on those. I don't. I mean, we've got the best techs in the business that yep. just do that, and they do it right. And and stuff like that. So that's usually where I leave it. The one thing you can do though, flush your engine. Yep. Salt water, flush the engine, no need for ear muffs. We talked about this last week a little bit. You got that little adapter there on the side of the engine. You put that on, you don't even need to run the engine anymore. You just turn the hose on and, and you flush all that salt water out of the block there, out of the engine. And that's the number one number one thing that you can do for preventative maintenance between those 100 hour increments or 12 months so so there hey marine max leisure boating's actually in the backgrounds watching this with us so they have a good point on here so send us your pics you're out catching fish you're doing things like that send them to us man we love to see it you know yeah show, show, show us those fish pics or it didn't happen right Oh. <laughs> well, I, I, I said picks or it didn't happen, right? We're losing. All right, John Langley, Longley, Pro XS versus the Yamaha Four. Um, work guy. Uh, we sell well, but um, the. S's, the Mercury products, you know, beyond reproach. I think they're in a league of their own now. For sure. 
for sure. Mercury, Yamaha, both great engines. Um, let's see what put on here. Rough water stuff. All right, somebody had asked about tips. Uh, just go slow. Don't outrun your vision. Um, and on your chart plotters, always leave your tracks turned on. That way you're laying down a breadcrumb trail so you can follow yourself, you know, back to, to the dock, to the slip, to the ramp, uh, wherever it is you, you left from. Have a good spotlight on your boat. You can get one now, you know, take it home, plug it in, charge it up. So then it's cordless. So if you are plugged in, into the, to the boat, you're not going to be draining your battery down. They use a lot of power. Mm -hmm. um, so a handheld spotlight, don't run with a spotlight on the whole time. It's just to kind of illuminate a channel marker. You're going to flash it on, hit it, and then turn it back off and run. You don't want to be blinding other boaters that are out there on the water as you're, as you're going along. Um, and then, uh, like I said, just take her, take her slow, take it easy. Cause you don't, you know, want to obviously, you know, run into something. Right. More, more familiar with the area you're boating in too. It, it helps. And then radar, which we can get into a whole other oh, yeah. subject on that radar at night, radar for fog. Don't get me uh, started on FLIR. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and then storm. I mean, all that stuff that it does. So that'll probably be another segment at some point. Uh, we'll get into, you know, radar and stuff. Yep. Tr tr trust your electronics, but use your common sense, right? Yep. Practice. Use your electronics on a nice blue bird, nice, bright, calm day. That's when you should be using your radar and stuff for the, and, and, you know, your fish finder, your FLIR, any of your stuff. So that when it is come, does come time, you need to rely on it and use it. You're not trying to learn it. For sure. For sure. Because then it's too late, right? Yep. Um. All right. Good question here <laughs> from, from Ann. What is the best way for a new boater to practice docking skills? So we're going to give you the short answer to that, and I'm going to hit you with the Ryan Seacrest American Idol answer, and that's tune in next week because we are going to be covering that extensively in and out, docking, everything docking. But we're not going to do that to you because nobody likes that. Some quick pointers, one quick pointer. What is the best way for a new boater to practice docking skills? Not around other boats. <laughs> not around other boats. Finding something that you're comfortable with because everybody's going to mess up and um, they have to do it probably more than once. What do you think, Keith? I like that. I like that. So. Slow and steady. So good stuff, guys. I want to thank everybody for joining in once again. This is Boating Tips Live. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll be here every single week, 3 p.m. You know where to find us. Marine Max Leisure Boating on Facebook. Don't forget, don't forget to give us a follow on Instagram and YouTube at Marine Max Online. Twitter at Marine Max. Next week, we got some great topics for you. We'll get to some other questions. Sorry we couldn't answer them all today. Once again, I'm Captain Nick from Marine Max in St. Pete. I'm Captain, Captain Keith. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining, guys. See you next week.